Hello, everyone. My name is Anika Shiasson, the Executive Director of the New Brunswick Environmental Network, and I'm so pleased to partner with Nature NB today to bring you this webinar. Um, so as you saw, Jenna is here to help us with all technical difficulties, and we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you have any issues, uh, please send her a message. Um, additionally, if you'd like to introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from, that would be lovely. I myself am in Moncton today. Um, uh, additionally, on since we are on Zoom, we would ask that you keep your mic muted unless you are speaking during the question period. Um, this webinar is being recorded, as you may have noticed coming in. So if you do not want to be uh, featured in the recording, please keep your camera off and feel free to use the chat to ask your questions later tonight. And then lastly, uh, I would like to thank the Environmental Trust Fund, uh, whose funding is making this webinar possible today. Um, and finally, to launch us into the purpose for tonight, I'd like to introduce Samuel, who's going to teach us how to decode the wall of green. Over to you, Samuel. Hello, everyone. I'm Samuel, so I'm the Communication Coordinator at Nature IB. And this is this webinar is, is thanks to the Environmental Trust Fund's funding. So I'd like to thank them, uh, the government of your project, for funding in this webinar. So hi everyone. Uh, we're gonna today we're gonna decode the wall of green. So how to become plant aware with simple cues from nature. So I am Samuel Legrelli, as I said before. So I've been working at Nature and Beast in September, and uh, since I've been started working, I've been really uh, uh, focusing on plants and how to teach it. So I've I've really I've really appreciate your feedback today. If you if you have anything to add. Uh, to my resources so I'm good. we're going to share a bunch of resources on how to learn about plants and how to decode the wall of green so this is the wall of green i'm talking about this is a, a photo taken by a friend uh it's a really um yeah it's, it might might seem scary to some but it's what we're going to try to decode over the next uh, webinar and maybe at the end of the summer you might be able to know uh, a few of those species if you go in the forest and you learn about them so this is uh, basically what we're going to talk about today. So as you can see, most of these plants have a very similar characteristic. Uh, you might guess that they are all they are all they all have share like the same characteristic. So we're going to look at plants that share that characteristic and uh, maybe try to identify them. So the goal is to decode the wall of green with simple cues from nature. So at the end of this workshop, you'll be familiar with scientific taxonomic ranks, uh, so species, genus, and family. You'll be equipped with beginner-friendly resources to better understand plants. And you'll also have some vocabulary for plant parts that you can use in a, any ID book that kind of talks about them because we all know the human parts. We all know arms and fingers. So plants also have the, these parts themselves. So we're going to look at them and try to decode them. So you're going to be able to start IDing right away because I'm going to show you some, some paths for easy plant identification. So uh, the contents of this webinar, we're going to talk about definitions, so species, genus, and family. We're going to see some apps, books, websites, vocabulary about flower anatomy. These are all basically like resources to help you learn about plants, so plant ID specifically, because uh, you might know about apps, but there's a bunch of things that are more traditional maybe or more uh, established that is also very useful for going deeper into, into plant identification. And uh, where to start? Well, we're going to learn how to read a key well, so that's uh, that's really like the basics of it. But uh, uh, the ID blitz also is going to be uh, it's going to be really uh, important today. So we're going to basically get you right away into ID plants. I'd like to first acknowledge that the land now known as New Brunswick has been the, the home of the Mi'kmaq, Olastokwe, and Passamaquoddy since time immemorial. This territory, more than ever, needs us to rekindle the traditional link between ourselves and nature. And the first step might just be learning to know what's around us. I'll also start with a, a quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer, the author of Braiding Sweet Grass, who says, the land is the real teacher. All we need as students is mindfulness. So this is a great, a great way to learn about nature is to basically be mindful, go into nature knowing that we don't know most of it. And we, we, we really need to be humble in knowing more about it. So. Uh, don't walk in the woods uh, pretending that everything's in a book because it's not. Uh, everything, everything is open to, to knowledge. So everything is open to us observing and trying to know what's around us. 
So I'll start with, with a question to, to prep you guys for, uh, for the rest of this webinar. Um, what's your favorite thing about plants? So we're gonna have a polling application. So if you have your phone handy, you can, you can participate. And if not, you can participate in the chat. So what's your favorite thing about plants? I'm just gonna get this thing. And so this app is called Poll Everywhere. You can go into the, the link, uh, mintleaf678, or uh, scan the QR code here. So if you scan this QR code that I just zoomed in, uh, you can uh, try to participate in this uh, question and answer. So we're going to have this throughout the webinar to ask you basically like little keywords that you can you can share. Uh, so that if you put two words, try to put like a hyphen between it because it might show up separately in the cloud. But we're going to have a word cloud uh, trying to show you, show you what other people have said. Yeah, they're alive, there's flowers, there's plenty of things. Um, yeah, diversity, they're calming. Yeah, there's there's so many things to say about plants. I think uh, personally, my favorite thing is that there are so many of them and we don't know anything about them. So I guess the complexity of it, but uh, yeah, you can definitely find a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, about plants. Uh, flowers are are what what attracts us, I think, as as humans and as bees too. Uh, if you think if you think about a bee, well, it's made to be attracted by flowers. So there's so many things that you can say about plants that are really interesting. So yeah, so this app is pretty pretty fun because you can see the word bunch up. So as people put the same word, it kind of bunches up like the calming word. And so the calming seems to be like a really a good thing here because uh, you can go in the woods and you can forget all about your troubles. So I guess that's what plants bring us. If you go in the woods and there would be no plants, it wouldn't be so calming, right? There's also vegetables. Gardens are a great place to start learning about plants. So, so many good things. Photo in the chat, we got photosynthesis, freshness and colors, uh, the greenness, so many things. But yeah, yeah, they can. They're very resilient too. Uh, we don't know much about them, so so many things. So we're gonna go to the next. This was kind of a test to see if you guys were able to participate, but yeah, I guess it's, it's a good a good start. So we're gonna dive in right into the taxonomy. So what's taxonomy? It's basically a way to organize the plants and every other living organism. So we have, uh, we're gonna focus on the seed plants right now. So yeah, I've told you how plants share a common characteristic from what you saw in this photo. And um, you probably saw a bunch of leaves, right? But um, I would say the, the leaves also are a characteristic of the seed plants. So um, it's very much plants, including moss and fern, excluding, I meant moss and fern relatives. So, um, so the plants that exclude moss and fern relatives are mostly seed plants. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about algae here. They're not really plants, but also uh, mosses and ferns are uh, don't produce seeds. So all the plants that produce flowers, all the plants that produce cones, they're all seed plants. And the way to organize them is taxonomy. So we're going to talk about the kingdom and the different ranks between uh, the, the plants. So what, what here this means? So this is, uh, this is the kingdom of the plants here. And then you have several levels down uh, a clade, which is uh, the, the, every single plant in a clade has a common ancestor that can be traced sometime in history. So you have the clade of seed plants has a common ancestor somewhere. So that's what clade means. But the kingdom is basically like the, the top rank uh, that we're going to talk about today because the rest of the top ranks are, are much more general. But the kingdom of, of the plants is like the kingdom of the animals, like the kingdom of the, kingdom of the fungi. It's really like the one that we look at the most for, for classifying very high level um, organisms that we can see with our eyes. So um, with the, the seed plants, we have uh, we have many like ranks below them too. We have the angiosperms, we have the gymnosperms. So the angiosperms are the covered seed, the gymnosperms are the naked seed. So why is this all important to know? Well, I'm gonna show you because at the bottom of the of the of the all of these ranks, you have uh, the plants that we need to identify. So, uh, if you go right at the top, you have uh, every every single rank, and it all goes down like a, a common ancestor clade way, and then it goes down to the. Oh, I'm gonna show you the middle of it. About about in the middle, you have the monocot. So, if we go back, 
the, the, the water lilies are not a part of the monocots and the gymnosperms. Yeah, the naked seeds are basically like our conifers and our um, they're like big trees with cones. But if you go down one, you have classifications within the core angiosperms, which are the flowering plants that are not the water, water lilies and the basal ones. So all this, all this to say that there are very uh, specific differences between the two groups that we're going to look at today. So monocots and dicots. So these are the flowering plants that make uh, one little leaf and two little leaves. So cotyledons, which which makes the word monocot and dicot. And the little leaves are basically at the number of one and the number of two. When you talk about the, the little seed, the, the, the first thing you see out of the ground is the seed. So it makes these little leaves that pop up. So the petals have multiples of three as a general rule is what I put there. But some plants have exceptions as we're going to see. So, but with the dicots, the petals generally have the multiples of four or five. So, so these are uh, the middle classification, like at the middle of the of the ranks. But at the very bottom, you have the family, the genus, and the species. So these three, I think, are the most important that we're going to look at today, because uh, they're asteraceae. There's uh, there's the asters. There's the goldenrods. What do these all mean? Well, the Asteraceae is the family. So the family is a, is a rank that's uh, uh, the, probably the third the, the third most uh, from the bottom. And then there's a, there's sunflower family is, is includes all of these things. So you see that hierarchy here, uh, the genus and the species are uh, the ones that are in the species name, but the family is like the hidden one that shares all the characteristic of all these genuses and species. So um, you have the Canada goldenrod, the Solidago canadensis. You have the seaside goldenrod, the Solidago sempervirens. So the Solidago, you see the genus Solidago, uh, and the sempervirens is like the species. So each one of the, these uh, share a characteristic, which they're yellow. Not all goldenrods are yellow, but these two are yellow, and they have the characteristic of being a bunch of uh, a bunch of flowers that make these like goldenrod. So that's why they're called goldenrod. And then uh, if you look at the American asters, they all have these uh, these very great ray flowers that these uh, these bigger ray flowers uh, in like accompanied by an inner flower, uh, a bunch of inner flowers that make up this compound flower. But the compound flower is also in golden rods, but you can't really see it because it's so small. But if you go in with a hand lens, you can see it. So this is all to say that every member of the sunflower family has this compound a uh, structure that makes it really recognizable. So we, we can see how the family, the genus, and the species fit into this puzzle. Um, but I think we're going to look at the bigger picture next. So why is it important to know the Latin names? Well, uh, it's because the Latin names basically give you a blueprint of what you need to identify species. So we're going to look at the OneZoom website. Um, so the OneZoom website is basically a way to see all the species in the world. So you have the humans that we know of, of course, because there are lots we don't know of yet. But the, the humans fit in there, the plants fit in there. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, different species on there. So we're going to go trying to get overwhelmed. Just try to see how complex it is and how uh, the science has uh, simplified a lot for us. So on the Wenzu website, you can see how uh, it's very much. So you can see this tree of life. So this is really like the tree of life. And you don't even see the kingdoms yet. So, like, this is all uh, what's there to see for the bigger part of the of the tree. So, if you zoom in, you can see here. There's like these bacteria. There's like these. Uh, there's these like. So the the first thing that emerged on Earth was that, but then it went further down the line to us. So now you have the complex cells, the eukaryotes, and then you get the plants and the animals. So the animals here, and then you get. So we're not going to go to the animals yet. We're just going to go to advanced search. So you can go to advanced search. You can search for, I'm just going to move this part. We're going to search for humans. So if you search for humans, and then you can trace a path to, you can search seaside goldenrod, what we actually got to in the last part. So if you go there, you can see the path trace between humans and sea cycle above. So this zooms in all the way to the bottom. 
all the way to seaside goldenrod so you can see how big this is like this is not a simple thing so that's why we're only focusing on the family the genus and the species today because uh, this is a big deal and this is how scientists classified into taxonomy every or organism on earth that we know of so you have seaside goldenrod here you zoom out you get to the genus which is the goldenrod and then you get to the family which is the asteraceae so with all the asters and the sunflowers and every plant that we know but if you zoom out you can see that we're all related so you have this uh this very big zoom so we're very far relatives but we're all relatives at one point So science shows us that we're all eukaryotes, but you can zoom in and find humans eventually. So if you zoom in, you have the mammals, the primates, and then you have the humans. So yeah, this shows us on the moon. So yeah, we've gone that far. Just to show that uh, we, we just made uh, the entire known species into one tree. So this is pretty impressive to look at. And I think it shows pretty much the complexity of it. So, um, we're going to return to our presentation because that was a big parenthesis, but I'm just going to show you resources now just to make you uncover that complexity and try to translate it into the real world because it can get kind of overwhelming if you look at it from a from a, from a technical standpoint, but in, in the real world, it's very much more concrete and it's it's easy to get overwhelmed, but don't, don't be overwhelmed because we have plant apps. Like right now, it's probably the... the the most talked about thing in botany right now for for beginners is probably the plant apps because uh you can you can basically have your your plants identified by your phone so if you zoom in on your phone on a plant like i do with this calico aster you can probably get it to identify the calico aster if you don't know it but what's what's common with it is that so uh, before we dive into it so have you ever tried a plant id app so we're going to ask you uh, which plant ID app have you tried? So you can go to that QR code and you can like basically tell us uh, what app have you used. So there's, you can say never, you can say uh, a bunch of things, but yeah, which plant ID app have you tried? There's a bunch of them. I think, I think I know uh, there must be about like 50 or 60 that are popular out there. Um, yeah, I see picture this, Seek, iNaturalist. These are all, Google Lens is a popular one too because it's just in the Google app, you can definitely look at plants. But yeah, iNaturalist is a popular one. So yeah, there's so many things you can do with them, but um, I'd say, yeah, PlantSnap, uh, that's another one. So we're not going to go through all of them. We're just going to look at the ones I'm most used at using, most used to using, because a lot of plant apps don't really tell you a lot of things about plants. They just tell us what plant it thinks it is. So yeah, I naturally seems to be the most popular, as I would have guessed. Thanks for your participation. Um, here you can get plenty of signs that says uh, apps that identify plants can be as little as four percent accurate. So um, this article from uh, New Scientist says that. Uh, some apps can be uh, not very accurate. So this is basically talking about all the apps. But uh, here we have a, a, an article talking about the Flora Incognita application specifically, who found that the application was 85.3% accurate with images with reproductive organs or with only the target plant of the image being better identified. This shows you like basically the, the easiest, like this is a scientific article but the easiest way to identify a plant is probably going into one of the apps that give you, that hold your hand and tell you how to do it. So how do you do it? We're gonna talk about that. Um, Flora Incognita, the one that talks in the article, it asks you to take pictures of each part. So basically uh, it says, uh, uh, the Flora Incognita says, here, take this picture of this flower. And it says, take this picture of this fruit, if it has a fruit or the stem and of the whole plant. So that's why it's so good. It's because uh, you get that high percentage because it gets it gets a lot of uh, different uh, parts of the plant, and the more pictures, the better. And um, similar to flora incognita is that seed allows you to narrow down from the kingdom to the species. So this is why I wanted to mention the whole taxonomic tree 
is because you get to understand how iNaturalist actually does their identification. So Seek is a, is a by iNaturalist. Uh, what's the advantage with Seek is that you can send it to iNaturalist, which is a, a very big database of millions of species. So it gets experts to identify the plants. And um, so in this in this slide, I haven't included iNaturalist because I'm going to talk about it later. But Seek is, a, is this app where, uh, so it starts with the kingdom, it usually goes with plants, and then it goes with uh, the, the dicots or the monocots or the ones that you've looked at. So it's you, now you know what's a dicot and then what's a monocot, hopefully. And um, But there's always exceptions to what I've said. So you might see a plant with the three, three petals and it might not be a monocot, but that Seek is going to help you narrow down what plant it is. So it's what it is, it's a search engine. It's not a it's not a definitive solution to plant ID. It's just a way to work out common species and flowers and fruit. Um, but none of these apps are perfect, and you need to confirm the ID further. So this is where our resources come in. So like our books are every everything that we've mentioned so far is is the is the as the complexity of it. So um, it's not easy to identify plants from the leaves, from the stems, from all of these parts. So this is where books and um, Especially if you look at dry plants at a herbarium, then you get some books that are very much more uh, suited to identifying those. Uh, if you look at uh, plants that don't have flowers in the woods, you can you, you probably can't get a nap to work out what it is. So we're going to look at those. The books, uh, I brought a few books for you to, to maybe search. Uh, the beginner-friendly ones I found. Um, so this uh, Thomas J. Elpel has made botany in the day. So this is a a very innovative way to look at plants. So we've talked about the family. Um, this book allows you to learn botany basically uh, in a day. So this is another edition that I've got. So you can learn the basics of botany in like probably a day. We're not going to get uh, the whole the whole thing, but you're going to get basically like what parts of the flower or what and how to start identifying plants um, and the basics of it. But if you look at the different families in the book, so I'm going to turn off my my uh, background so you can get a better look at the book. Um, here you have basically my background story. So you can basically get the here is the, the mosses here, but you can also get flowering plants. So you have the patterns of the of this plant family. And if you look, if you look closer, you can see the different images, and then you get a description on how the family fits uh, the different parts of the description. So you can have a bunch of resources that tell you uh, what what family this plant is in. It's not an absolute resource, but it's it's useful in like recognizing patterns in plants. Uh, then you get the Newcomb Wildflower Guide, which is the classic field guide like that most beginners use. Um, so you have a uh, uh, basically like a key, but a very basic key. Uh, what a key is, is, is that it's a, it's a, it's called a dichotomic, a dichotomous key because it has this very uh, binary way to look at plant identification. So, but it, it's on several levels. So you have a yes or no question, or you have an A or B. So is this, does this plant have compound leaves or, or something like that, you know, like very, uh, very basic words. Um, but if you don't get the, the plant vocabulary, if you don't understand it, you won't be able to really look at keys. But this one is very well put together in the sense that it uses a very basic vocabulary. And then it gets you to those very nice drawings that you can look at in the field and you can probably compare. Um, it puts you pretty much straight at the plant or at the plant family. And then it gives you the, the genus and the, the species for, for the most common plants in our region. It's also made for the Northeast, so that's a really good one to get because the uh, Northeast is uh, is our region. So if you think of Canada, we're at the Southeast, but it, the Northeast is basically the, the region for the wildflower guide, which covers pretty much the same geographic area. And then you get the plant identification terminology. The reason I put it there is that it's uh, it's basically showing you all the words for plants. So this one, it has like illustrations for every word that it shows. So if you want to really uh, learn about how the plants uh, parts are, you can get this one. It's it's a bit expensive, but it, it it has all the images next to the words, so you can you can really get to know all of the different words that are in the floras. So the next part is the floras, 
to really understand those, you need to understand the words that are uh, proper to botany. So uh, they get the flora Nova Anglia, you get the flora of New Brunswick. So you get these, these two floras are probably the most uh, used in this region uh, in English because, um, yeah, it really covers like our plant species, our local plant species, uh, the ones that we get here. Uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed when looking at plants, but if you look at the ones that are local, uh, luckily we don't have so many. So we're like a northern country, so we don't get as much biodiversity as the south. Uh, I it must be re really different being a botanist in Costa Rica or, or Brazil for that reason. But uh, if you get a flora of New Brunswick, so I'm just going to show you how complex it can be. The flora of New Brunswick is this book, and it has uh, descriptions of various keys. And in the key, at, a very, at the very beginning of the book, it basically shows you uh, what family the plant is in, and then it guides you step by step to each part of the uh, up towards the species. So um, we're looking at uh, very much uh, the very much beginning of the key is that uh, you get sentences like uh, overly, overly fully inferior flowers are perfect, regular, mostly formerous floral tube often prolonged beyond tip of ovary, fruit a many seated capsule or small indehiscent indehiscent and burlic. So you get these words that are very much not part of the common vocabulary for uh, our, our everyday lives. So that's why we need to learn the, the words of plants when dealing with florals. The websites are, are easier, I think, because they can define the, the words themselves. So uh, you don't need to go in like an external resource or at the end of the book to get each word. Um, iNaturalist is a website that uh, shows you, so I've talked about it earlier, I'm going to go deeper into it. So it's a website that shows you all the observations. So it's really nice to go into it and to look at the all of the different parts of, of the website. So here's my profile. You can see uh, I have a community here. So if you go to explore, you get uh, different species. So here we have 174 million 402,509 observations. These are all the observations of species in the world. But if you go and narrow it down so we can get goldenrods and all the goldenrods in New Brunswick. So you can look at different pictures. So this is a good way in the winter to go and look at plants and how they look like because I think that they're really, they're, I, I think that there's so many pictures that it's a really well presented way to look at plants, and um, it's a good way to get the get get a certain uh, vibe or feeling from a plant that you wouldn't get by just uh, looking at one picture. So I think it's a really nice way to start. So um, we're looking at uh, again to our presentation here. Um, here we have iNaturalist, but we also have GoBotany. So GoBotany is a good website for plant identification because. So we're going to look at it again. It tells you how uh, the plants are all uh, ID'd. So if you look at a plant, let's take again Seaside Goldenrod because it's our mascot today. We have the definition of it. And you get the native range, which is really fun. You can get Seaside Goldenrod all across Texas, up to Florida, and then up to New Brunswick. But you, you don't get any in the West that, are, that is native pretty much. So. Now here it says the waxy fleshy leaves are distinctive. So that's the best way to identify them is really by the leaves. So all of these things, you get more characteristics. So you can really have fun in like learning about botany. Flowers here, so define what is a flower if in case you needed that. So um, ray flowers, in fact. So ray flowers are that was I was talking about. So the, the outer flowers are ray flowers and the disc flowers are in the middle. So this is a really good characteristic of, of the Asteraceae family. So it's all defined if you hover over it, which is really fun. And I think that it's a really cool resource for, for, for beginners or for, even for experts, especially. So back to our presentation. The UND Herbarium is, is nice if you, so they're currently digitizing their archive, which is fun because you can go to actually learn about plants. And uh, I, th I don't think they're at the goldenrod level yet, but just to show you how hard it is to identify a, a dried plant. So you have the keyword, you can go to goldenrod uh, or carex. I think they're at the carex right now. So carex is a sedge. And if you look at the carex here, the local ones, 
they have the high resolution image for every single plant that they're currently scanning. So it's not a finished project, but uh, you can look at it and you can always visit to see and try to identify plants yourself. So this is a very hard plant to identify, or it might not be if it's a Carex, but depends on your on your level, of course. But um, I guess grasses are harder. Grasses and sedges are a bit harder than flowering plants in general. And this is a very general uh, term, but a very general uh, statement. But uh, yeah, you can see how the dried plants are and how they're a bit harder to identify because they don't have the same characteristics as uh, the, the real uh, living plants. So now you have herbarium. So question, uh, what is your favorite resource? So I've showed you a bunch of resources, but like, what, what do you use to identify plants? Did you ever try to identify plants using an app? Or We already talked about apps, but what about books and websites? So try to answer uh, by using the app again. And I'm going to show you in the screen, I'm going to show you the coloring book that the herbarium has put up. Because if you want to learn about plant parts, you can always uh, look at coloring them, which is really fun because you can really see um, a bunch of plant parts. So this is the plant parts that are in the herbarium book. Uh, you can really see the color picture and then you get the drawing. So I think it's a really nice resource to start uh, in some plants because you really get to know them once you color them. And the same can be said with uh, nature journaling or or maybe uh, gardening or different activities that are really uh, really interesting. So uh, I get some good good responses. Uh, iNaturalist, Peterson's News, yeah, gardening phone in, which is really fun. Gardening is a really great place to start. That's where I started because I had a garden, and I mean I just was there all day. So I sometimes so I would just look at plants and try to understand them. And I guess the, the ones that interested me more were the weeds growing among the vegetables, but that's another another subject. But um, yeah, a weed is a relative term, of course, because some of them turn out to be native plants. Um, so yeah, nature, I guess nature is the best resource. So I would second that very popular word myself. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. So the intention of the following slides is to introduce the different flower parts. Um, we're going to look at plant parts because they're great to know when you're looking at resources. Uh, you can always look up those words again. Uh, but yeah, the different flower parts are really are really nice to know. So let's build an imaginary perfect flower. So this means that all the flowers are not perfect. So perfect just means that it has the male and female parts on it. So we're going to look at those right now. So this perfect flower now has, uh, it, now is you see the developed version of it with all the, the stamens and the pistil. Uh, so these are the male and female parts that you see. But the perianth is the first part that we're looking at, is the combination of all the petal, petals and the sepals. So it's really like the structure that protects the developing reproductive parts of the flower. And this is before the the, the, the all the parts have grown. So it really like, uh, protects the parts before they're mature. So this is a really important part. And I would say that the, the, the parts that come after that are mostly for reproduction and making seeds. Um, but yeah, the perianth is to protect those parts. So if you ever to see that word, uh, we're not going to remember all of that today. You don't have to. But uh, yeah, we're going to look at those. The pistil is the female part. So uh, it's also the receptacle for the pollen. It's uh, to describe either a single carpel or a group of fused carpels. So a carpel is basically like the, the don't get overwhelmed. Like, because I think that you can always learn this later, but if we look at it right now, you can get a better idea when you look at it further in the book. The carpel is basically the pistol, um, but the different parts of it. So say you have like a pistol could have three carpels. So this could be a compound pistol with three carpels. But within the carpel, you get the stigma, the style, the ovary, and the ovules. Each of those parts have a, have a function. The stigma receives the pollen. Uh, it goes through the style and into the ovary where the ovules are. And the ovules end up being the seeds. So here we have a trillium. So this is a monocot, a monovitilda. And it has um, basically uh, three of these uh, 
car builds. So as it has three pedals mostly, it has six uh, of those uh, stamens, but it has the three carpels. So the stamen, I just said the word, it's the male reproductive organ of the flowering plant. So many of them make up together the endoecium. The endoecium is basically the, the, the combination of all the, the stamens. So you can get six stamens together make up the endoecium. So this is the male part of the, of the flower. It's the one that makes the pollen. So the one that the bees get the pollen from, then put them into the pistil to get the seeds made. So this is how a plant reproduces. Uh, here you have uh, the, the two distinctive uh, seed, uh, the, the two parts of the stamen here. They're called the anther and the filament. You can see them clearly here. Uh, you can get the anther, uh, this, this end part, and the filament is this. But here is the pistil of the of the sheep laurel. So you can get that sheep laurel plant. Uh, you can see the, the, the pistil here. And then you can see the stamens all around it. And the same with the rhodora, which is a kind of rhododendron. Um, it's our native rhododendron, so you can see the 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 carpel and the, and the pistils and the stamens. And so you can really just try to understand each plant by looking at its parts and seeing how they all play together. Uh, here we have like the different parts that come after that are the petals and the corolla. Uh, these are from the perianth, which we saw was the protective uh, unit of the flower. Uh, the petals are like really the individual unit of the corolla. But the corolla is like the collective term for the petals, considering the inner world of the perianth. This basically means that petals are like the inner part of the protective structure, but uh, you, can, you also get the outside part. So uh, you can see here we have an inner part and an outside part. So these protect, but also uh, attract the bees when you when, when they want to get the pollen from the plant, so they know what to look for. A lot of the of the plants that attract bees. Have uh, have very pronounced flowers, and the wind pollinated ones have uh, very like diminutive or very reduced flowers. So this one definitely wants to attract bees. It's very obvious. And then you can start to see the different parts for the trillium. So you can see uh, the spring ephemeral has mostly six um, six uh, stamens and three carpels, which make a pistil to revise. And then you have the petals that make up the the corolla, and then you have the sepals, which are the last part we're going to look at today, which is the individual unit of the calyx. So a, a, a pattern you're seeing here is that there's so many words that look different, but sometimes it's just a, a compound version of another word. So uh, with the sepal and the calyx, you have like the compound version of the, of the word is the calyx, and the compound version of the petals is the corolla. So you really see like a pattern here where words might look like a different thing, but they're just a plural version. Um, so yeah, we've looked at the flower now, uh, but this is how it looks like. Sometimes you can see how the, 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 the parts look different. Like here we get a, a white violet. Uh, the white violet has uh, this, uh, if you remember uh, New Brunswick's flower, we also have this flower in our logo in HRMB. Uh, the bottom uh, flower, the bottom petal of the flower is very much, uh, makes the plant uh, bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical. That means some flowers are radially symmetrical. So you get like a circle looking flower, but this one is very much like you can divide it by two and you get the same on either side. And it's the same with the with the white turtle head, which is a, a really nice turtle head. And then the, the bumblebees like it really well too, and the hummingbirds. And it's also a really uh, bilaterally symmetrical because you can divide it by two and you get those two sides that are really like the same. So. Some flowers like the trillium, if you look at it again, are trilaterally symmetrical. So you can get like very much circle flowers or divided by two. So we're not going to go further because there's all these terms for leaves and venation, and the different uh, different like margins of the leaves. So you can get a bunch of definitions, but that's why you need to go further yourself if you want to learn more about it. Today, we're just going to focus on the, the basics. So this is the kind of the bunchberry. Uh, some Latin names are very complicated. This one is because it's actually a subgenus of the genus. So the genus is really Cornus canadensis, canadensis. but the this one is like a subgenus, so it's it's more recent. But you don't have to learn all of these by heart. Just learn the bunchberry. 
and later you can learn the Latin name, or maybe look it up if you want. Um, so some terms are more complicated than others, but this uh, this is not a petal. This is actually a bract, so it's a modified leaf that acts as a petal. So it kind of serves to attract bees to the center so that they can pollinate it and make the fruit at the end. So this is the same plant, it's just, you might have seen it in your walk in the woods, but it just uh, makes these beautiful red berries at the end of the summer. Uh, this is the common milkweed. So it has uh, uh, it has the, all these really cool looking flowers. They're gradually symmetrical. That means they have like five sides that are the same. So you could divide them by five. They will all look the same on each end. But all the milkweed have this, uh, this very interesting uh, word that I can't pronounce. I don't remember it. And we're not going to learn it today, but it's a word that stands for the structure in the middle. So this structure hides the stamens and the pistils. They don't actually show up because it hides them. So you, you don't you can't even identify them unless you dissect the flower. So this is to show you that a lot of plants don't really follow that perfect flower kind of scheme. So just to just to let you know, sometimes it's better just to learn how the flower looks in general than to learn all the different parts. So don't get overwhelmed by this. And here is an exception. So we have the painted trillium. Uh, this is a really fun way to, to think about plants. Uh, there's always an exception somewhere. And you can say that it's called a trillium. It's called a trillium because it has tree sides, but this uh, is obviously not part of the trillium, uh, part of the trillium norm, let's put it like that, because it has four petals. It probably has four carpels. I haven't looked closer enough, but uh, yeah, it does have four sepals. It has four leaves. So I'm thinking that every single thing is a multiple of four. So this is a really cool exception. I call it the quadrillium. It's from a, a member of, of a Facebook group I'm in. So yeah, it's a, it's a great exception to, to the rule. It makes it, it makes it fun to learn about plants because you don't have to learn. Uh, there's no recipe. It's all, a, it's all a bunch of patterns, but every plant doesn't follow the pattern. So with that, like where to start, you know, like you got to truly know the plants, not only know about them. For example, if you look at a patch of trilliums, instead of looking at a single trillium that has four petals. Well, they're gonna know uh, basically how it has, uh, how it's an exception from the rest of the trilliums, for example. And that's how you truly know the plant species. You just not only know about them as you've read in the book, but you're like, you're really like uh, acquainted with the plant. Um, and you can always ask these questions also, like where does this plant grow? Like what is the habitat? What are the other plants present? Like, do they interact? Who does it attract? So insects, birds, and mammals, and amphibians. Uh, is the plant native to here? Uh, is it native all across North America? So these are all questions we can ask. And uh, is the plant woody, herbaceous, vining, low growing? Uh, when does it flower? When does it fruit? These are all great questions to ask, but I'm sure you can come up with a lot more by yourself. And it's, it's really not, it's, it was never dumb to ask questions. Uh, it's really, there are no dumb questions in, in the case of plants. Like you can really ask questions by yourself. You can maybe journal about them and try to answer them yourself. So this is a great way to learn. And uh, I think those questions just make us more inquisitive and it makes us, we, we kind of tend to ignore them sometimes, but they have a, they're a great tool to learn also. They're, they're a resource in, in themselves. Um, so here we're gonna look at places to start. So right now it's in the winter. You're uh, you're maybe wondering like why is this workshop in the winter? Well, if it was in the summer, I'd much rather go outside and we can talk about plants outside. But in the winter, it's it's a bit harder because the conditions are are very much more hard. Uh, you don't have leaves, you don't have flowers, but you have these buds that really can uh, maybe not differentiate within the species. Let's not be perfectionists here because. You can't get to the species to every plant, especially not with uh, winter buds. So you have uh, here, and this is from an old book called uh, Winter Botany. Uh, you have a whole branch of botany people that are interested in the winter buds. So you have the huckleberry, the maple, the basswood, and the cherry. But all of these uh, either have uh, alternate leaves or opposite leaves. So the buds follow that same characteristic. So this is an, this is an alternate leaf. Uh, flower, the huckleberry, and the maple is an opposite leaf. So this is a really great way to think about them. They're basically the, the thing that comes before the leaf. So it does follow the same structure as the leaf. 
and you can start with maybe a try to try to see like what plants are there right before you you start to see the spring because the window is really my favorite period of the year because you get the uh, the service berry you get the gold thread uh so these two are have white flowers uh but they're really different so gold thread here this one has six petals so is it a monocot is it a, a dicot we don't know because every i don't know i haven't looked at it but i let's just assume that it's because I've seen that every gold thread is a different amount of petals. So there's an exception to the rule of the monocots and the dicots. Some plants have varying amounts of petals. So you can't take a, a rule for granted. Uh, service berry is a really fun plant because it has these flowers that bloom uh, for five or seven days, depending. And you get uh, really uh, a bunch of pollinators when they flower because they're all waiting for that perfect window of uh, late May and early June. To, I think it's like more like mid-May, but you get the service berries in the, in this uh, kind of kind of peak period, and all the early emerging pollinators are on there. Uh, so it's a great question to ask, like what visits that plant, right? Who visits that plant? Uh, and then you get the berries that are very much appreciated by the birds and everything. So service berries are really fun to identify, but they're impossible to identify by the species. Sometimes you you really get like hybrids. So sometimes you won't even get the species. Uh, this is a really fun one, the Rose Twisted Stock, uh, the Virginia Spring Beauty. So you get a bunch of different plants uh, in the spring. And these are, you shouldn't be overwhelmed because they're all really fun to learn. And you can even point your phone at them and it might know the, the name of the plant. So here's some more examples. They're all written down. Uh, the beach is the best um, place if you're really a beginner because it's not only fun to go there to go to crop it from the sun and maybe uh, get into the speed a bit if it's not too cold. But it's also a great place to start learning about plants, especially the native ones, because some plants are introduced, some plants are native, but uh, you get the sea rocket, the sea lavender. I call them the, the sea vegetables because they all have like a vegetable name. Uh, the sea lavender is like, a, is not lavender. It's a different genus altogether. And it's, uh, it's really a, a, a cool plant because there's not, any that looks similar to it over here. There's a European version, but we don't get as many, and it's it's pretty easy to identify. Uh, this sea rocket is another one that looks really like rocket, like the vegetable. You also get the beach pea, which is a a, a very uh, pea looking plant, so you won't miss it if you go to the beach next time. So you don't get a big variety of plants because they're they they have to be adapted to the place, and they can't they can't be uh, really. Uh, too, they can't be too diverse because plants really have a hard time getting to the beach and surviving the elements. So this is a really fun place to go if you're looking for very specific plants. So let's study some plants. Uh, this is the last part of the webinar. Um, the source of the Mi'kmaq plant names are the Plants of Anuagadi by Gilbert Sewell and the other uh, dictionary I found here. But um, yeah, so this is a, a good place to start. I, I've included some Mi'kmaq names because it's always Nice to learn about how the plants were uh, were regarded. Uh, so before the Europeans came, and uh, still as they still regarded today. So uh, the Wolastukwe names are from the Wolastukwe Talking Dictionary, the Wolastukwe Pasamakuri. So there's a there's that resource there. Uh, Gobotni.nativeplantrust.org is a good resource. So I've just shared it, but you can always go there to at the same time to try to identify plants if you go on the wild. So I was supposed to look at it again, but we already looked at it. So let's go, uh, let's go identify plants. What do you think these are? So we'll just try to drop an answer in the chat. We're not going to go to poll everywhere. Uh, just so the picture is still up. Try to identify these, uh, these spring, these spring plants from just from the buds or from the little buds that you see there, the leaves. Uh, if you, if you can't identify the species, Try to go for uh, what you think it looks like. Like, did you ever see this in the wild before? Uh, what do you think is the is the good? Uh, what do you think is the good word for what you see there? Like, is that a flower? Is that a bud? Is that a branch? Is that a leaf? Just try to try to work that out in the chat if you want. So uh, we're going to look at the species later. So yeah. Uh, Seems to have alternating buds on the stem. This is a good, um, yeah, this is a good uh, observation because I think 
Uh, members of the Birch family, so this is a good hint right there. Uh, the Birch family has uh, has a very good uh, recognizable trait is that you get these uh, female, uh, well, they get, okay, so this here, and you're going to drop in a hint, is also a flower, and this is also a flower. So, yeah, we get these twin flowers and this single flower. Uh, so this is a member of the Birch family because uh, you get these what are called catkins. So uh, not all flowers are perfect, as I said before, uh, and then get some flowers have the male parts and the female parts on separate flowers, and some plants have the male parts and the female parts on two different individuals. So these are called, another word that I won't say here, but you get all of these different uh, exceptions for plants. Yeah, it might be a purple flower, but might not be, we don't know. Um, and you can always look up the plant later to see how different it is from this photo. Yep, you get catkins, so. But this was not a birch, so this was a beak hazelnut. It's in the birch family, but what's really recognizable about it is that it has this female flower and these really small male flowers. So the male flowers here are smaller and they're um, then the birch, so they're not really drooping, they're more like hanging out on the side. And then the female flower here has this really vivid red when it comes up. So you get like this magenta color red, uh, and it, it's a really cool bud to see. Um, and if you go into parks, you can get, in, the, in this region, you can get plenty of them. So um, a lot of beak hazelnuts in some places. Uh, this is a sweet fern. So this is actually a plant that's, uh, that's makes these uh these uh, this bunch of catkins but it's it's not actually a member of the birch family it just has these bunch of catkins that are the male flowers and on the female flowers you get the nutlets so you get like the spiky nutlets that come out uh that are really cool and then you get the really distinctive leaves and then you get the american fly honeysuckle which is uh, the lonicera canadensis so this is a a flower that makes uh, so this is not the full flower it's not even bloomed yet so it makes a, a good Good looking a red fruit in the in the end of the summer. I don't recommend eating it. But yeah. Uh, so we're gonna go to the next uh, part. Uh, this is a very distinctive uh, conifer. Uh, just look at the different parts of it and try to tell me uh, what it is. So what are the different parts? Are these buds or are these? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. And uh, this is also a branch, but what kind of branch? Do you know? And this, I don't know. I need to know from you guys before I show you. Do I get any answers? So I'm going to talk about what I recognize. Uh, these are these are looking like flowers to me because they're they're not buds because well it's i mean do conifers usually have flowers they don't look like flowers but they do have flowers so uh, but they're not pollinated by bees i think but i don't know but we can we can always find out but they don't look very showy so we can guess that they might not be pollinated very often um so they uh they produce this fruit at the end and then you get uh, this these look very much more showy than the last one so these are interesting and this is a this is a bud but is it a bud is it a structure at the end i don't know so it's it's a you can you can maybe observe and tell me but is it going to grow into a leaf is it going to grow into so let's look at the species now Maple, yeah, you get maple. Canada U, there we go. That's uh, that's the, the U. So it's, it does look like a fur, but it's a U. So uh, the the way to recognize it is that it grows really low and has these like little flowers. And then you get the red maple. Um, so the red maple is the flower that we're looking at. And then you see the wild raisin. So this wild raisin, often you get like the single thing coming out but this is a double one and then it just makes like these really pretty fruit at the end seven we're just gonna go quickly because we're nearing the end of the webinar 
Um, anyone have guesses here? All right, I'm gonna give you a hint. It's under an umbrella and it has these very similar flowers and black fruit in the end. If you don't know, it's fine. This is a wild sarsaparilla. It does look like it does look like some kind of onion, but it's not. It's actually a dicot called the wild sarsaparilla. It's um, it's a really fun little plant. But uh, yeah, you can always see it in the woods if you travel and look at the different plants underneath. Um, get these berries at the end of the summer. Now these, um, what do you see there? There's something really particular about it. What do you see at number eight? You see the thorn, yeah. That's a really uh, important characteristic. So, um, yeah, I guess from that we can recognize that it's a, it's a hawthorn. So from the thorn, you can see that the the hawthorn is very uh, is very recognizable, but also like from the very serrated flowers and fruit. So from that, we can start to recognize the, the plants in the wall of green. But uh, this is from other wall of greens. I haven't put the, the species specifically in this one that I showed you at the beginning, but we can start to maybe go in the woods and maybe recognize a bit more what we're seeing. And this uh, this is a, another member of the of the viburnum family. So I guess yeah no, I was mistaken. We had actually already looked at it, but we uh, what, what do you recognize as change in this plant? Like has it grown? Has it has it gotten berries or flowers? Or you know, look at this. Yeah, number ten. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Wild raisin is the one. Yeah, that's the one. So if we look at the species, wild raisin, uh, in in the Latin name, you can see it's a variety. So you can all even get like deeper, uh, like you can get deeper in the species, but we're not going to look at that today. It's basically to, to say that this is a variant of the viburnum nudum. So we already look at this one, but at the end of the summer, it makes these berries that are, are uh, like very much like raisins, so they look like raisins. And then you get the steeple bush, so Eastern hard hat. Uh, these ones are uh, these ones are pink, but they're they're very pretty. So they they're a kind of spirea. So I think they're really fun to look at. Eleven, you get you can you can maybe guess this one, but you have to think that they don't look the same as we usually get them. I think someone in the chat got the answer. Yeah. So usually you get them in red, but here they're yellow. So we get the sumac. So uh, the sumac is red, but it gets the, the berries are red, but it gets the flowers that are yellow first. So this wall of green is the la last activity. If you if you notice that we're already paid, so we're gonna finish with, uh, with this activity. So do you see any species? Um, we're gonna just look at, we're gonna just uh, send you a link and you can name any species you see in the wall of green. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna send you an image in the chat and you can name species you see there. So if you go to the same link that you've been to in the in the beginning of the webinar, you can start to, uh, to say like this, I see this species, I see that species. Uh, so yeah, the link is in the chat and you can name the species and we'll try to, we'll try to, respond as we go. So it's a bit it's a bit hard of an assignment, but I'm just trying to show you like um you can maybe identify plants from distance. I think the easiest one is really like yeah the dandelion. Uh, I see I do see a few ferns in there. Uh, there's a few uh so I have to credit Neil Vincent from the photo. He helped me identify a bunch of uh, a bunch of plants in there, and uh, yeah, the dandelion was one of them. But if we look at it again, we can see a bunch of things we already saw. So you can see here: there's, there's the conifer. So this is a 
definitely a conifers from, from afar. Um, this is looks like something we already saw. Um, and then uh, this this thing here. So what what do you see here? It might not be in the same form as you saw it before, but it's there. Um, and then this, we already saw something like this, so you can go into it. I see the aster, yeah, looks like aster is in there too. This is really not an easy assignment, but um, it does look like a balsam for me too. So yeah, this is a great exercise, like a photo to, to try to tell, like, you might not get the species exactly, but just to tell me, like, how the tentative identification helps you uh, try to find plants. Oh yeah, you get the star flower, you get the star sprilla. You guys are great. This is really great. Because um, we're going to look at the words coming in, but yeah, you get the Aurelia. That's a great one. The maple, the fern. Yep. So we're going to jump at the end, but this is what I was able to see. Thanks for your participation. We were able to identify a bunch of things. This leaf looks like a wild raisin. Uh, these leaves look at, like a beaked hazelnut. So this is like a part of the wall of green that you see here. A big part of it is like a beaked hazelnut. But we, what we looked at and what I want you to remember is a lot of plants that we see out of the wild is like wall of green. A bunch of them are just uh, seed plants. So you can look at the, the seed plants and try to identify them. And they're not too hard to identify. If you go repeatedly in the woods at the same spot, or if you go to the woods very often and you just try to walk in the zigzag the next time you go into the woods, at least for part of the hike, and you might be able to see more plants than you did before, just to identify them. Because if you look at plants that way, in the way of like identification, we can really see how uh, it begins to be more uh, more easy to get them. So, for example, when I'm walking the woods, I try to spot plants specifically, and the next time I'm in that same spot, I see how much they've grown in the summer. So this is a great way to see like how the plants are growing and how you can identify them. It's not only a, a way of looking at a plant when it's in flower. You don't have to only do that. You can always look at a plant when it's not in flower and try to see. Like here, everything, almost everything, you don't see any flowers, but you can still identify a bunch of plants. These are all tentative identification, but I think that it's a really cool way to, to look at nature is to, to go there repeatedly. And if you miss the window, it can be harder. The spring window, as I mentioned, that we're gonna get in, uh, in April, May, June. But um, yeah, this is a great way to learn is to go out in the woods and get to know the plants. So thanks for your participation. Uh, so before I get to the question uh, period, I'm gonna talk to you about this survey. So we can evaluate the survey. Uh, you can click on that pull everywhere link and you can just evaluate how I've been doing and I'm really trying to improve. So just tell me if you notice something is uh, missing from the, uh, from the survey. So I'm gonna take any questions if you have some and just, uh, yeah, ask away. For those who are leaving or maybe who are not staying around, uh, I'd like to thank you for your participation. And uh, it's really been great to learn with you. You've been really helpful in this webinar. I'm defining a lot of what grows in the wall of green. So hope next time you go into the woods, you try to zigzag a little bit, ask the right questions and try to come up with some on your own. Now, any more questions are very much appreciated. So, are there any good resources for identifying poisonous plants in New Brunswick? I would say uh, the poisonous plants, um, they're, a lot of them are poisonous. I would just say, start by learning the plants uh, as, as they are. So, like, I would say um, a lot of what isn't edible might be poisonous. So, But there's a way to learn about plants in the terms of, like, characteristics. So, try to learn about plants by whether flowers 
or by their fruit. Um, I say uh, I haven't found a good book for specifically poisonous plants, but if you look at any uh, botany book, I think you'll you'll learn a lot of poisonous plants and what plants you shouldn't eat. So I would say before eating a plant, you should always just double, triple, quadruple check everything you've been you've been doing and try not to eat whatever you find in the woods, please, because it's um, so you get the risk of misidentification. Uh, within some families and genuses, it can be very dicey. Like some genuses, uh, like the carrot family, most of the plants are poisonous. So you shouldn't even touch that one. I sure don't, don't know what you're doing. So I very much, uh, I would very much avoid any uh, any misidentification in that sense. Thanks so much. Any other questions for Samuel? Um, you can drop them in the chat. Um, you should be able to enable your microphone as well if you'd like to speak your question. We'll give you a, a couple minutes um, if anybody else has anything to say, and then we'll end it for tonight. Thanks for sharing your feedback. Um, yeah. So I don't have any more questions. I'm going to hand it over to Anika. Hey, I don't really have much else to add beyond that, but thank you to everyone who made it out tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the webinar. Um, of course, there's still a lot to learn, as there always is, but we hope that this was a good start for you. Um, please, if you, um, the poll will be open further on as well if you want to fill it out later. So feel free to save that link. We might as well send it in an email later as well. So you have the chance to give us your feedback. There's opportunity to give us more ideas for different workshops as well. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you and we hope that you enjoyed tonight. Thanks everyone.